Well, hi, everybody. Um, let me be the last to wish you uh, a happy new year. And uh, thanks for joining us. We'll have, uh, have a good time today. Some people who signed up, I think, have an impression that I'm going to talk about clinical technique. And I'm going to show befores and afters of things that we've done surgically. I don't do that. <laughs> so if you're expecting that, you know, we're, we talk about business, we talk about persuasion, we talk about, and persuasion is really it. We talk about presentation, we talk about improving your, your business, we talk about all of those types of things. And I'm going to use today, you know, kind of, oh, my microphone is over there. I'm going to put my microphone over here. Okay, hope we can hear better now. Um, we're going to use today to show how giving a patient alternatives is going to make a, it's going to make a difference so that's what we're going to talk about today yeah i'll give you some stuff um i told you to give you some stuff and i will give you some clinical stuff because uh, you know some people feel that um invasive clinical resorption is something that can't be treated and that's absolutely not true absolutely not true i mean even when i was doing surgery and i haven't done surgery for only in earnest for almost six years you know or five years. So, um, but understand that this is something that we've been treating all along. Um, something that we see more and more commonly now than we did at the beginning of my career. So of course I'll give you some of that clinical stuff. Um, and, uh, anyway, that will be good. So, um, how was last year for you? How'd you do? So here's how we did last year rivaled our best year. It did. So we were closed down for, well, seven weeks, but really eight weeks because the first week we came back, we put in all our new protocols and things like that. And um, so we did a lot of training to make sure our protocols were in place. Then we went to a half schedule so for, for the rest of the week. So really, we've been, we were closed for eight weeks. But even with the eight-week closure, yeah. Yeah, we rivaled, um, we rivaled our best year. So uh, it was good. Um, it does mean that there are a lot of things that we have to harness together to, to make that work, but, um, that's what we did. And this week we had something like 16 new patients call. So I think the trends are going to look pretty good. Yeah. People are concerned. I think there's some optimism uh, with regards to the vaccine. So maybe that's helping. Um, there's still some patients who are choosing not to come in to see us because they're concerned. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. But um, vast majority um, are, are continuing to come in. Our hygiene book is full. Um, so the things that you would be looking for are still happening. So most of the people on here are specialists. Most are periodontists. Um, it can happen. It can happen for you too. Uh, you know that things are a little bit different the way we do things. And so uh, that's why, um, you know, that's why we do what we do. So um, for those of you interested, this is brought to you by the Institute for Dental Specialists. And you're, if you're interested in what the Institute for Dental Specialists can do, we'll just write to me at lee at directorofdentistry.com, lee at directorofdentistry.com, and we can talk about what the IDS does. Yes, we do personal consulting, but we've created a do-it-yourself program, so you can consult yourself and don't have to pay the kind of money you have to pay us for consulting. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for the, for the IDS. Um, and we always thank the Oral Reconstruction Foundation. By the way, this is the educational arm of, of BioHorizons. Uh, and uh, we thank the uh, Oral Reconstruction Foundation for providing the CEUs for us. So uh, um, that's nice. And for those of you who are on uh, first, as long as you're attending for the bulk of this session, so you're t attending for more than 35 minutes, then you'll get a continuing education certificate. It'll come from the Oral Reconstruction Foundation. Usually you get it at the beginning of the week, Monday, Monday or Tuesday of next week. And that's only for live attendees. We have no way of tracking attendance or anything for people watching this on YouTube, but we're glad you're watching it on YouTube. and hope, uh, hope it's worthwhile to you. Okay, so let's talk about um, invasive uh, cervical resorption and let's find out what that's all about. So uh, hang on while I get to my, uh, while I get to my computer and let's go to uh, 
share screen. There we go. Okay, so um, we're going to let me just make sure that I just got a text and nope. All right. Sometimes people give me a text when they can't see me or hear me, but apparently you can see me and hear me. So, uh, so that's good. So we're going to talk about the treatment of invasive cervical resorption, but really we're going to talk about that in terms of giving the patient a choice of treatment. Okay. Giving a patient a choice of treatment is really where we are here because we want, we want to take the alternative point of view. Okay. Anybody can place an implant, including us. And we should be prepared to place implants and insights and, and make sure that that can be done. But very often these days, implant is the only choice that a person is given. And they'll see us as specialists or as advanced level practitioners and say, is there something else we can do? And if you say the same thing as the last person, then, okay, <laughs> that may be the choice. But given the fact that, uh, that there are our choices and we give the patient choices and we can give the patient percentages uh, of time that those choices will work so the patient can make an adequate decision, then uh, that's what we're talking about with, with ICR. Okay, so that's the weighted alternatives and then... Uh, uh, literature review, reviews work really well. So we'll talk a little bit about how to do a literature review and how to get that to the patient and how the patient will be impressed saying, nobody ever did that for me before. So the, um, the, the uh, articles, just take a look at this. I, I know that some of, some of you will ask me for this. Please don't just take a look at this and take, uh, not that I don't like to respond, but we've got lots of people who are, are contacting us and, and um, given the fact that you just look at this video and you can look at these references yourself. Um, we're going to refer to Rick Schwartz. Rick Schwartz is a uh, excellent endodontist in, um, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And he, along with, uh, Eric Rindler and, um, and, uh, and Bill Robbins uh, created this great article, which I'm gonna show you in a second, uh, about uh, invasive cervical, surgical, uh, cervical re erosion, um, resorption. But all of this comes originally from Heather Say. And Heather Say did uh, a article, um, actually a series of articles, um, three articles in quint quintessence, all that came at the same time, and that was uh, way back in 1999, as a result of research that Heather Say began, I think, in 1980, um, showing these lesions, classifying these lesions, and determining success rate and all that type of stuff, um, as well as predisposing factors. There's a lot to be read here. So I definitely would encourage you to order this uh, literature review. Um, and the way you get it is uh, at ADA.org, okay? So members of the American Dental Association, go to ADA.org, then you click on Member Center, and then click on Library and Archives, and you can contact the librarian, and the librarian will give you articles. In fact, that librarian, and Laura is the one that I correspond with most, but there are a number of librarians there. They have found medical literature for me. They found everything that I wanted. Um, when I've been doing uh, literature searches for for um, uh, for my own problems, for example, um, but uh, or problems that that my patients might have, and they're very quick in their literature review. They're very thorough and uh, have been really helpful. It's probably the best resource for that I've ever gotten from the American Dental Association. In fact, I don't use the American Dental Association for anything else. But boy, do I use the library because those librarians are just are just fantastic. Now, it doesn't mean the American Dental Association isn't doing a lot. They are. But in terms of what I'm I'm working on myself, yeah, yeah, the, the library is worthwhile. So get to know the library and just get onto you get onto that site. Uh, you have to know your membership number, and uh, you might have to use your membership number and establish a login or whatever it is. You, you guys all know how to do that probably a lot better than I do. Um, so let's um, let's move on with this. So Heather say classify these lesions. So what's invasive surgical, uh, cervical resorption? Essentially, this is what we call external resorption at the osseous crest. Um, patient receives an injury, 
um, often this is a result of trauma. And what happens, or at least theoretically what happens, is that rather than having a periodontal ligament that is interposed between the alveolar bone and the root, um, the bone is now growing against the root. At least the theory that I heard um, was that um, osteoclasts uh, can't differentiate at that point between bone and, 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 uh, and dentin, so the osteoclasts start to eat, eat away the dentin. And that may have been, who knows, there may be another theory by that time. That's the theory that uh, I'm going on um, um, at this point. And so as a result, we start to get um, uh, this, this um, resorption. And you can see it right here. So you can see the class one, you can see the class two, class three, and class four. And so what Heather Say did was to look at these um, four classes and determine in his own practice uh, his success rate um, on keeping those teeth. And so if we look at Heather Say's uh, class one classification, look at almost 100%. Class two, which is just to the pulp, or maybe just short of the pulp, almost 100%. Okay, then we get to class three, then it starts to drop off, and we get to class four, and it really drops off. So in terms of total success, and so we're looking at that third bar over. Okay, this bar, this bar, here's a class three bar, here's a class four bar. Okay, so um, based on that classification of severity, you can start to make determinations as to what you're going to do yourself. And by the way, I would encourage you to read these articles um, because the articles, that's what I did when we first started treating um, cervical resorption years ago. Um, read these articles, and uh, and Rick Schwartz, by the way, was was very very helpful. So, let's take a look at uh, Rick Schwartz's article for a moment. Okay, good. So, management of invasive cervical resorption observations from three private practices and a report of three cases. So, let's go down to here. Let's go to the nice color pictures. Okay, this is in the Journal of Endo, 2010. Uh, you saw it in the reference before. Let's find it. There it is, JOE, volume 36, number 10, October 2010. So what's the case? Okay, so there it is. You've got on the canine, you can see this lesion. Um, actually, you see it here. Um, he obviously felt that this was close enough to the pulp that he was going to have a sore patient or a patient would have a toothache after, after the surgical procedure was done. So we'll look at that in a moment. So the endo... Uh, was done first in a case like this. We always do endo. No, actually, if I see dentin, um, we'll look at we'll look at a case that we're proposing this for. Um, if I see dentin, uh, very often we'll treat this area and we'll see whether the patient has symptoms or not, and then do endo. If it's through to the pulp, then there's no choice, of course, but uh, to do endo. As some people, laser people, might say there is a choice. I don't think there's a choice here, but um, you know, that's in the eyes of the beholder. So you see the reflection of the flap and you see this typical um, um, appearance of the resorption with this uh, bloody type of tissue. Um, you take trichloroacetic acid, trichloroacetic acid, you see in the article. Um, and this is made by the compounding pharmacist. And they can make it in aqueous form, they can make it in gel form, gel form is preferred. We've used an aqueous form, but this is real acid. So you're reflecting the flap, and when you reflect the flap, you see this organic material. You actually place this acid against the organic material to dissolve the organic material. Now you can use a curette to take away some of it, but the acid is quite caustic, and so you've got to be really, really careful. Notice the rubber dam clamp. Those of you who are periodontists, when's the last time you used a rubber dam? Okay, yeah, use a rubber dam because if this gets onto the onto the mucosa, um, it's it's going to hurt. It's going to burn. Okay, so we've got to be really, really careful with the way we use this stuff. Um, we'll use that to dissolve the organic material. Sometimes we'll use it more than once in order to make sure that all of the organic material is removed. Um, and we have been made by our local compounding pharmacy. And everybody these days has a compounding pharmacy, probably more than one um, that's uh, close to you. So you just go over to them and say, I'd like trichloroacetic acid. Take a look at the articles. Uh, don't just do this without reading the article and ask your pharmacist to make it up. Now it's, a hundred, it's about a hundred bucks, maybe a little bit more. 
Um, and it doesn't last very long. It doesn't like it has a reserve in it. So that's going to be a materials fee that you're going to add on if you choose to treat these um, so that you're reimbursed. But find out, you know, the pharmacist will tell you how much it, um, how much, how much it costs. And unless we have two or three of these going on in a month, which we don't, uh, then you're going to be making new trichloroacetic acid every time. So it's a definite expense that you, that you want to cover. So, you see this, you can see after the organic material is removed. And then what he's done is to, is to restore this. We'll often use Gerastore to restore this. And then uh, you suit the flat back and, uh, and you're done. And if this would be likely, if you did endo, this would be a class two lesion. Um, and if it's a class two lesion, then uh, you're still very close. You're in the high 90s, I believe, for success rate. In treating these over, I think it was measured up to a 14 year time period. So that's uh, that's pretty good, isn't it? Let me see if there's anything else in this article that, any nice pictures that we can see before. Yeah, here's, okay. So let's take a look at the severe case, okay? And uh, <laughs> take a look at that, okay? And <laughs> now, I would venture to say that it's going to be pretty darn difficult even to do endo because you're going to go do, do the endo through this organic material, which is probably eating away uh, a good part of this tooth uh, from the lingual. Um, and yeah, those of you who want to make sure you're isolating with a rubber dam clamp, yeah, I mean, you're going to have to make sure you're getting the palatal tissue numb. You're probably going to have to put the rubber dam clamp on the uh, palatal tissue. You might have to use a laser or a radio surgeon to be able to quiet the tissue down while you're doing the endo. And you're always going to do the endo first. Um, but if you're looking to isolate, it's a little bit difficult. doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that you, um, you, 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 you're, you're careful to do it and you want to make sure that you're coordinated with your periodontist or, or who, who, who's going to be the surgery. So that as soon as the end is done, rather than you're worried about leakage into that area, you know, as soon as the end is done within, within 24 hours, you're in there doing the uh, surgery that we're talking about. But notice how big a lesion that was treated. Okay. Now you can get into trouble here. Okay. You can get into trouble. And we're going to talk about that. But do you always have to extract the tooth? No. As a matter of fact, let's assume this patient had a high lip line. Okay, patient has a high lip line. Do you want to extract this tooth? Do you then want to have to reconstruct the gingiva? Because we have to, in order to be able to make sure the gingiva looks exactly the way it should before we put the implant in. And how much time is that gonna take? So uh, understand that, that there may be a good reason for this because if we extract the tooth, which may be the more of the sure thing in something like this, aren't there consequences? Okay, so we might wanna give the patient some choices. We'll talk about it. We'll show you a patient that I saw this week and I did give her choices. So, um, but understand this architecture right here, that's do, you know, that's, that's kind of difficult to duplicate. And if you have to lose two adjacent teeth, boy, what happens to that? What happens to the uh, papilla? What happens to the size of papilla? What happens to the gingiva between numbers eight and nine? You know, so um, good, good to strategize, good to strategize. And sometimes better to save the tooth uh, because you've got a whole lot of uh, cosmetic variables that We've got to make sure, okay, before we uh, before we reconstruct, the patient loses a loses a pillow between numbers eight and nine. That can be fairly serious business, can it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad I saw that picture. What else do we have here? Anything else? No, he's showing other lesions and how he's treated them. So the, this is the third case. Um, uh, here's a case right here. So we take a look at this, and I had a case like this. Oh, it was probably 15 years ago. Um, and I said the chance of treating this was not very good. Uh, she said, we'll treat it anyway. And I did, and the <laughs> patient lost her teeth. Okay, so understand that if we have multiple lesions, at least in my experience, in my limited experience, but I'm sure you look in the literature, if you have multiple lesions like this and try to treat every one of them, well, listen. You take a look at these central incisors, teeth can break off. I mean, 
essentially chop down a tree here. So I wouldn't look at this as being predictable, but the isolated single tooth, yeah, yeah, that can be uh, that can be quite predictable. You take a look at the cases that he's treated here. Uh, now this is midroot, and what he's treated, and this was treated, I believe, internally. Um, I'm not sure. Read the article. Um, you get the idea as to what um, what can occur here. Okay, so intake call. Um, so Amberly took the car. Patient calls and said she has uh, reabsorption. So it's actually resorption numbers eight and nine. But Amberly wrote down what she heard, and that's fine. She was referred by Doctor L, and she's scheduled on Monday, January fourth at nine fifty a.m. Okay, and then we make the doctor call, and the doctor call, we leave a voicemail. Um, so if a person doesn't, uh, for those of you new on the on the uh, on this uh, presentation, I call all my patients. I call them before they come in. So the doctor call, uh, but I I won't keep on calling if they're not there. I'll say hi, it's uh, Dr. Lee Sheldon. Thanks for making the appointment, January fourth, quarter meeting. Uh, if you have any questions before coming in, just give me a call and. And uh, we'll set up a, uh, a phone consultation. Occasionally people call back because they want to talk to me. And if they talk to me here while I'm at my office, I'm not wasting chair time. So uh, it's, it's a good thing, particularly if they're a bit on the long-winded side. Most of these uh, doctor phone calls are done in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at the clinical stuff. Okay, so here she is. Uh, I won't dwell on the whole thing, but take a look at what you're seeing here on tooth number nine. And you're seeing a little bit of this on number 10, too. So you see, this is a clear on Zoom. Um, there's your shadow right there, and there we are right there, okay? So, um, and I believe she was involved in trauma um, when she was a kid. Um, so well, this has been a long-standing problem. I would say she's probably in her 50s, maybe, well, we'll say 50s, we'll say early 60s, I'm not sure. But anyway, so let's take a look at what we're looking at here. All right, so that's the cosmetics of the situation. She does like the crowns. And papilla formation is pretty darn good, isn't it? Okay, a little bit longer on eighth and is on number nine. Okay, just go across. Let me take a look at it. Probably showing way too many pictures. I am. All right, look at it from the palette. And look at the lower. Okay. I don't have a smile shot here. I wish I did. I don't know why I don't. I think we had a smile shot, but it showed the patient's eyes, and I didn't want to show you that, and I didn't crop it. Sorry about that. But what's important is this. When she smiles, I'm able to see these papillae, okay? So it's a relatively, it's a moderate smile line, but certainly not one of those that covers over the, uh, the teeth and you can only see the incisal third. No, she's showing gingiva up here. So do I have a concern? <laughs> Darn right I do. Let's look at the CT scan. Okay, so now we look at the CT scan and let's take a look. So the resorption that now we know is on the lingual. Why do I take a CT scan on every patient? On every patient. I mean, if they're 18 or 19 years old or something like that, they're not here for ortho or anything else, then, um, or soft tissue grafting, which is uh, a loss of alveolar bone, or not a loss of alveolar bone, but an inherent genetic uh, thinness of alveolar bone. I'll take a CT scan for that. I wouldn't know what we're dealing with. Um, before we go in, but yeah, we take a CT scan in every patient. Why? I want to see this or able lesions or whatever it is. I've got the CT scan. Why not use it? So, um, and so in a case, by the way, the CT scan is useful for implants, it's useful for alveolar thinness, it's useful for apical lesions, it's useful for a lot of different things. So I want you to notice a couple of things. Number one is the lesion. And the lesion goes right through to the gutta percha. 
So there's no question about that, at least in my mind. Any question in your mind that goes through the gutta percha? Yeah, okay. So, but take a look at the second part. And the second part is, notice where the incisal edge of the lower is against the upper arch. Does that concern you? It concerns me. By the way, the patient was already told she needs an implant. There's no other choice. She's got to get an implant done. Okay, so seeing me for a second opinion, am I going to say, yeah, you got to get an implant done too? Well, I might, but I would venture to say that if we give the patient a tooth sparing option that she's never heard before, that in fact, we may have a little bit more, what, credibility, diagnostic ability, knowledge of the literature, in other words, particularly if we start to talk about what we've seen and we reference Schwartz's article or Heather Say's article, then doesn't that bring you a little bit above the mechanical way you have to take the tooth out and, and put an implant in? Okay, so even if we chose, or if the patient chose to extract the tooth, look what happens when you're giving the patient a little bit more knowledge. See? And it's giving the patient a choice. You know, they can go anywhere and get a tooth out and take and do an implant. And if the person and if the problem is not carefully described to the patient as far as what the risks are for dental implant placement or the risk for saving this, then we're putting ourselves at risk and we're putting the patient at risk. We haven't given the patient all the information, informed consent. Now, a couple things to notice. Number one is the relationship of this to this. You know, wouldn't we all like to have like a 20% overbite? And here, she's got that. Well, how do I do that? Like that. Okay, so instead of this, we got this. More forces here. And that's why it's important that when we take our CT scans, we take the CT scans in occlusion. Yeah, I know what you're told. I know you're supposed to put gauze or cotton rolls or whatever it is between the teeth for whatever God, for what for whatever reason. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me because frankly, I want to see the occlusal relationship on the CT scan. Don't you? Don't you want to know what's there? How the teeth are in function? What would happen if we put a cotton roll between these teeth? Would I know? Would you know? And if I'm trying to spell out risk-reward relationship, don't I want this critical piece of information? Can I get this piece of information anyway? Well, maybe with study models. But even with study models, I can't, I can't see this. But you can with the CT. Okay. So let me scroll with the CT a little bit. Let's make sure there's... Uh, if there's any other information, we know we had a little bit of cervical re resorption. Got to see it here on number nine, okay, on the mesial number nine, okay, but not nearly as severe as that on number eight. So we want to call that, what do you want to call it? I don't see any, uh, any evidence that's going down farther on the route. It may be. Oh, you might say this is evidence, but I don't think it is. Um, so I can call this a class two case. And what did we learn in a class two case according to Heather Say's classification? Class two cases are pretty treatable. But you know what? There was never anything that said class two case in a case with a significant overbite, okay? There was nothing there that says that. So I think there's a little bit more of a risk here than what we might glean out of Heather Say. I could be wrong but I certainly want to cover my bases and I certainly want everybody to understand what the risk is, particularly the patient, because if the patient is going to make a choice, let's let the patient make a choice based on the literature and we go with science and by the boy, science is being, you know, batted around, batted about all over the place. You can always find a scientific article to, that's going to support your foreign point of view. That isn't the point. It's always preponderance of the literature. Um, and also, it's who's writing the literature, you know. So, if you're, uh, there's, a, there's a website called Retraction Watch. 
uh, you can see the number of scientific articles every day that are retracted because it was biased or it was dishonest information. So, um, you know, we're using science in order to be able to augment or to support our clinical judgment, but understand clinical judgment comes first, doesn't it? Okay, so you get the relationship here, right? Let's just complete the job by taking a look at what would happen if we did an implant here. So let's use my software. Okay, out of our software, version one. I've never gone beyond version one because I like version one so much. I didn't want to learn anything else. You probably can't buy version one, but probably version, probably in version four now, probably more than that. Anyway, I'm happy with version version one. It does what I want, so that's fine. So let's put an implant in here in order to be able to determine and show the patient that in fact an implant can be placed. Okay, so there's our implant. Let's see. Let's use the one we use, which is BioHorizons. Let's use tapered internal, which is what we use most of the time. Uh, let's make it a little bit longer if we want. So good. I mean, anybody here can't put an implant on this site? Now, would you choose to do an immediate implant? I don't know. If their tooth came out cleanly, maybe we would. I mean, Dennis Turner talks about socket preservation. That's a little bit off, isn't it? Let me move this off a little bit. That's better. Okay. So that we want to be able to, uh, to preserve the emergence profile and we don't want the pili to close up on each other. So maybe it's a good idea to put an implant in and at least put an abutment in and the abutment uh, will uh, be custom relined um, using a peak abutment in order to be able to preserve the papillary relationship. Would I want to do an immediate load implant here? Not with this kind of an overbite. No, 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 no. I would never do an immediate load there, would you? Okay, maybe you would. I wouldn't. I don't want that kind of a risk. So can I provide enough clearance so the patient doesn't bite on this? I can't. I don't think I could. So this is going to be some kind of a extraction. If possible, put the implant in the first day, preserve the papillae, preserve the support for the facial gingiva, and put an Essex around it, something like that. I like Essex. I, I don't do flippers. I do Essex. We have a we have a vacuform machine here. We're making Essex all the time. I don't depend upon the restorative dentist to do it. I put the Essex in myself because I know how I want my Essex done, or we know how we want our Essex done in our practice. Our practice has both restorative dentist and a board certified periodontist. So we do all we do all that stuff here, but. Even when I was just a periodontist and it was a referral practice, I want to put the Essex in myself. Definitely don't want a flipper. And if a flipper is in, I don't want anything crunching or pushing on that gingiva. You don't either, do you? Okay. So that's our implant approach. Okay, so we got that, right? Let's go back. So let me see. Okay, so the patient arrives, gave you the treatment plan, probably a little bit out of order here. So the patient arrives, the assistant um, is with me, and, and so Ashley notes the, the allergies the patient has and, um, and the reason why the patient's there. So, and so Ashley's getting into this conversation with the patient before I ever arrive, and Ashley has 30 or 40 minutes. By the way, Ashley is not a regular financial arrangements assistant. We usually have our financial arrangements assistants um, doing the examination with me, doing the x-rays, and also making the financial arrangements. So that person is carrying the patient all the way through from the initial part of the visit to financial arrangements at the end of the visit. Why? Because I like the continuity. 
patient likes the continuity too. She's establishing her relationship with one person rather than going to financial arrangements after the examination is done. Now, you may not be able to do that. If you can't do that, then make sure that if you're doing the examination with a clinical assistant, that the handoff from the clinical assistant to financial to the financial arrangements assistant is complete. Okay. That means that you or the assistant gives a complete history of the patient to the financial arrangements assistant. Everything that's going on, all of the considerations, the different choices that might be there. So the financial arrangements assistant isn't just spitting out numbers. See, the questions often come after the patient finds out how much it costs. So the financial arrangements assistant needs to be briefed thoroughly if she isn't doing the examination or he's not doing the examination with you, it needs to be briefed thoroughly so that handoff is complete to the FA assistant. And the FA assistant has the knowledge to be able to answer the questions, which is what the patient is looking for. Yeah, the patient's interested in how much it is, but where's price in the entire uh, sequence? And price is down to, you know, what, fifth in terms of the patient's concerns or sixth? So, I mean, unless we're in a very price sensitive environment, um, which we think we are, but often we're not, um, it's, it's, it's all of these things, it's the preparation in advance that is going to make a difference saying, with the patient saying, I don't care what it costs, this is the person I want to see. And then it has to do with the education steps that we're talking about, we're talking about right now. Okay. Now, a couple of things. We found out their pH level is 7.5. It's a little bit high. I mean, that's higher than normal, but that's good, isn't it? You know, 7.2 is the, is the normal pH for blood. I believe it's 7.2, not 7.0. Check me on that. Um, and many of our patients who are taking medications have dry mouth and all that type of thing. They'll show up with um, pHs of 5.5, 5.0, something like that. And so they're really, really caries prone. If they have pHs of 5.0, 5.5. You know, will they will they rinse out with all the things they need to rinse out with as long as often as they need to in order to be able to take care of the of the dry mouth and the acid problem? I doubt it. Periodontal disease is a lot easier to treat than caries and rampant caries, particularly when caries, rampant caries is due to a chronic dry mouth or chronic acid problem. So um, anyway, this is really good. Okay, angles class one, but but. Um, when we talk about overbite, overbite is seventy percent. That's a lot. And frankly, it's probably more than that. Um, so this is all of the examination that I'm doing with Ashley. Ashley's measuring or, or is 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 uh, giving me all those things. Look at this bruxism. Patient even admits that she bruxes. If we say bruxism, it isn't Lee's judgment that you brux. That's Lee's judgment on attrition. I'm asking the patient, do you grind your teeth? How many of our patients know that they grind their teeth? Most of them, oh, I don't grind my teeth. You, you see all these worn and sized ledges and things like that. You know what I'm talking about. Okay, so Lee's judgment is attrition. But I'm asking the patient, do you grind your teeth? The patient knows she's grinding your teeth. Hmm. What does that mean? Okay, so is that a consideration when you've got a central size of it's like this? Sure it is. Okay, and fraction erosion, well, that wasn't there. TMJ, there was something on the left side. Uh, we didn't know what it was. Usually I'll say early reciprocal click or mid reciprocal click or late reciprocal click or crepitus or whatever it is. We'll say that maximum opening is 50, that's good. Malin Patty score is one, that's, um, that means the pharynx is open. Be great for intubation if we ever had to do that. Palatal vault is good, gingiva is firm. Now, why am I doing all these? Do I need all of these things? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Why? Because I want the patient to leave the office saying, that's the best exam I ever received. So I want all of these categories. Good. Mel and Patty, why do we need that? We don't unless we're sedating the patient or we're putting the patient to sleep. It's something that I want to provide for the anesthesiologist if the patient is, is going to sleep. So why not include it in there? Mel and Patty scores, you know, it's open your mouth, stick your tongue out. How much of the pharynx can I see? Is it class one, two, three, or four? I want to do that. Okay. Okay. So we've completed the examination. We won't go through the periodontal chart and there wasn't anything there. Okay. There, so the choice is to save tooth number eight. And the way we would do that 
would be do a, do a flat procedure and berate on the lingual. That's six units. Six units is 10 minutes of my time, or each unit is 10 minutes of my time. Six units is six, six units. So it's, it's going to take an hour to do the procedure. We're going to treat it with trichloroacetic acid and perhaps a little bit of osseous if we need to. And we're going to do it from the lingual and we're going to preserve the papillae so that when we're making our incision, everything is going to look good because we're not going into the papillary area. We're going to reflect the flap. Oh, we'll take a, little bit of, uh, take a little bit of a bite of the papilla, but not much. Reflect the flap so we can gain access to this lesion and treat it with the trichloroacetic acid and fill it with gerostrum. Okay, that's, that's what we're looking for and make sure that the environment is dry enough to be able to do that. That's what we want in order to be able to create the aesthetic result. Okay. Or here's the other option. The option is she's already given. And that's to extract number eight, replace with an implant, and Essex will be needed. Okay, and these are the steps we'll do. We'll scan for the Essex, which will often be done by the restorative dentist. Um, and then, uh, but we can scan it ourselves. We have a scanner, which I would encourage. I, before we ever had a restorative dentist in our office, we had a scanner in the office. Um, that's neat. I mean, you can control the environment yourself. Um, so then we'll extract number eight. That's a two unit extraction. Okay, 20 minutes. And each unit has a fee attached to it. Uh, we'll do a bone graft with PRF and Mineros, which is the BioRisis product. And using a bioguide or a cyto cytoplast membrane, I'm predicting this in advance. Okay, and that'll take four units to um, to do the graft. Then we'll wait four months. We'll reevaluate re number eight, take a new CT, and then scan for a surgical guide. Okay. Then we'll use a surgical guide, place the implant, deliver a new Essex, and then wait two months before uncovering Ostel, and then the restorative dentist will will do the cusp above and a crown. And preferably we want, if, if we can get that implant in straight up and down, we'd much rather have the custom of up and crown be one, but in the central incisor, that's kind of difficult to do. Okay, so now I've given the patient two choices. Well, how do you choose? How do you choose? So let's go over this because, and we'll, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll use the letter that I wrote to the doctor as an example. So, dear Dr. Somoza, a patient presents for periodontal evaluation. Clinical findings are consistent with diagnosis of external resort from the osseous crest and the lingual number eight, possibly better than the mesial number nine, although I doubt it. Now, maybe I doubt it is too strong. Maybe there is. In fact, I think there is. I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, will we treat it? And eh, we may treat it while we're in there. Who knows? Okay. Um, she was involved in the car accident many years ago. They affected number eight, they, that affected number eight and nine. Both of those are endodontically treated. Um, first name of the of the referring dentist, as you astutely noted, is significant external resorption at the osseous crest and the palatal aspect number eight. The question is, should we treat it or not? Okay, patient takes exceptionally good care of her mouth and everything else is doing beautifully. On number eight, the resorption goes through to the root canal. I'd say we have a 60% chance of saving it. That isn't what Heather says, said. That's what Lee Sheldon said. And Lee Sheldon is influenced by a patient we saw earlier this year, just before COVID, who had a tooth like this, and she's bit down on something hard, and she broke it. Okay? And I want the patient to know, hey, we can treat this, but I want you to understand that this is something, that you take the responsibility here. Here, it's a 60% chance of success. I think we can do a better job cosmetically if we do save the tooth for all the reasons we described before, okay? And I think we can treat it, but understand that, you know, that, that you have a 60% chance of saving it. And if you lose it, if it breaks, which it could, okay? And particularly as she's a proxer. Uh, so how important is a night guard in a case like this? Um, particularly if she's a Bruxer, then we want to make sure that the patient knows, hey, you can break it. You've got to be careful of it. And I think there's a 40% chance of failure on this. And if you do, then we've got to start all over again, do it, doing what we said we were going to do to begin with, which is extract the tooth, do the bone graft, do the implant, and all, all that type of thing. So I want the patient to know that. Okay. And 
by having it written down here, you've got it, okay? So there's two approaches that we can take. From, oh, from a cosmetic perspective, um, the patient does show her papilla when she smiles. There are two approaches that we can take. One would be to save the tooth. If that were the case, we'd do a palatal incision in roughly number six through 11, not to include the papilla, do a flat palatal flap, use trichloroacetic acid in the palatal aspect of the rate and fill the area with Gerostor, okay? Now, I guarantee you that most of restorative dentists have never heard of trichloroacetic acid. I guarantee you that most restorative dentists don't know that a tooth like this can be saved. So let's assume that you save one of these and then you can take photographs and send it out to all of your restorative. Those of you who are working in, in referral practices, which is probably most of you, then you can do a little case study and show, hey, here's what we can do. And you can show that an implant may be, you know, may be a good thing too. But you can take this, you can refer to Schwartz's article, refer to Heather Say's uh, series of articles and say, you know, here's where we are with something like this. That's new information. And that's raising your stature to who? The referring doctor as well as the patient. Not bad. Okay. Okay. The other approach would be to do an implant. If we were to do an implant, this would likely have to be a staged approach. Implant is there is a great deal of bone loss, great deal of loss of bone support on the palatal aspect. Okay, so here are the steps we're going to take. And I want to put the steps in. Okay, remember, director of dentistry is doing the treatment planning. So you're doing the treatment planning right there. Okay, saying, so now, can the restorative dentist change the plan? Of course, but at least you're giving a stepwise approach the way you would do it. Give the, you know, the, the restorative dentist can change some of these patients. Uh, you know, uh, that's in discussion, but at least say, all right, number one, Create an Essex. Number two, day of surgery, remove number eight, do a bone graft, place palatal membrane, and allow the air to heal for about four months. Three, do a CT scan conventional or a conventional scan, enable to, to be able to design a surgical guide, place implant number eight and covering number eight, and then the restorative dentist would then do the uh, custom bone and crown. Okay, then if we were to save the tooth, then no crowns would have to be redone. If we were not able to save the tooth and we place an implant instead, my recommendation would be to do a custom abutment of crown number eight and a new crown number nine. Why? You want the two front teeth to match. And if you tell the patient, hey, I do both crowns because we're never going to get the shade exactly right between number eight and number nine. When we do this, we usually do two crowns at the same time in order to be able to make that look good. You've painted the picture now for the restorative dentist. So the restorative dentist doesn't surprise the patient by saying, well, I don't feel good about just doing the crown and do the parade. I think we're gonna do something in number nine. Well, the periodontist never told me that. You see, you're trying to predict in advance everything that might need to be done and make it so comfortable for the restorative dentist. Okay, good. I've given the patient both options from a cosmetic perspective, particularly if she likes the way the teeth look it may be a slightly better option to try to save number eight, but of course, there's only a 60% chance of saving it. And by the way, I'm dictating it into my phone. I'm dictating into Smart Recorder. And those who have been on these, uh, these, these webinars know that you know, I use Smart Recorder and then I, we upload it to Google Drive. My daughter types it out, okay? So, and I'm dictating it right in front of the patient. Okay, everything else is looking great. Thank you for your conference referral, blah, 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 okay? So that's where we are. What would you do? And at this point, the only thing that's of concern is make sure you're giving the patient options. And if you haven't learned about external resorption or invasive cer cer cervical re resorption, then start. To, then then go ahead and, and and go to those references. Now let's go back to those references. So for those of you who didn't get it right at the beginning, particularly when we had that glitch at the beginning, I have no idea whether that was recorded or not. Um, let's see. Okay, so those are the references. And for those of you who don't, uh, who, <laughs> who weren't here at the beginning or are looking at YouTube and didn't see the beginning of this, Okay, ada.org, go to Member Center, go to Library and Archives, and uh, just write the library and get literature reviews on, on whatever you want. Uh, usually what I'll do is go to PubMed, I think it's pubmed.gov, 
and I'll find the articles they want. I'll type in the subject. I'll find the articles they want. I'll then uh, um, just do a copy and paste, uh, send that uh, to the ADA, and the ADA will give me the articles usually that day, sometimes in an hour or two. And I've got those articles for whatever I want. And particularly when a patient has some doubts, uh, boy, is it nice. Is it nice? Hang on. I know you're not seeing this. Hang on. Let's go to share. You didn't see it. I blew it. I'm sorry. There we go. Now you can see it, right? Okay, good. So there is Schwartz, Robbins, Riddler, which was the original article, and that references Heather Say, and Heather Say is really the 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 guru on this stuff. Rick Schwartz, excellent, and uh, I would I would read Rick Schwartz's article, particularly with regard to clinical treatment. I would get that. So this bibliography is good, and so go to ada ada.org, member center library and archives, and do your research. If you're trying to do research on any topic any of your own health topics, then you can go to pubmed.org or you can go even to the ADA library and go to Cochrane Reviews. And the Cochrane Review, Co Cochrane Reviews has a literature review on, on, on many, many medical subjects, dental subjects. Cochrane Review did a great review on fluoride, for example. So if you want to see where the, where the literature is uh, on fluoride, hint, it's not very good. Um, so uh, that's it. There is one question, and let's see. You have to show your screen to get those references. Thank you very much, Andrew. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's good. All right, listen, I thank you for joining us. We'll try to do these every Friday. If you have any questions, uh, just contact me, uh, Leah, director of dentistry.com, and I'll be happy to answer you. Have a great week.